All right. Welcome back. Here we are. Judges chapter 15. Samson against the Philistines. So, before we kick it off. Great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. That was by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8 states, The end of a matter is better than its beginning. The scriptures are full of disappointing examples. Right? Lot had the privilege of walking with Abraham, and yet he ended in a cave drunk and committing incest with his daughters. King Saul began as a humble man, but ended up a suicide destroyed by his own stubborn pride. King Isaiah was a godly man until he became strong. When he tried to usurp the place of the priest, God judged, uh, God judged him by giving him leprosy. Ahithophel was David's most trusted advisor, but he ended up hanging himself. Right? He was Bathsheba's grandfather. Paul's helper, uh, Demas, abandoned the ministry because he loved this present world in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. We each should pray that the Lord will help us all to end well. Starting the race is great, but the point of it is finishing well and how many of us fall on the way. So when David faced the Philistines, he saw them as the enemies of the Lord and sought to honor the name of the Lord in his victory in 1 Samuel chapter um, 17. Samson's attitude was different. Let's take the first three verses. We're going to talk about Samson's rage at discovering that his wife is given to another. Right. So after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, Let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her, therefore I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. (laughs) So it's hard to know why Samson's father-in-law thought that Samson hated his wife. Perhaps this was just an excuse to explain why he did what he did, you know, giving it to his best man. Uh, Perhaps Samson's Philistine's wife poisoned her father's opinion of Samson in Judges 14 verse 16. So even though Samson was angry with his wife's father, the real root of the problem was the bad choices Samson made in love. He had no business allowing himself to fall in love with an ungodly pagan woman. No wonder Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 tells us, keep or literally guard or protect your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Failure to guard our heart can result in great trouble. So God used Samson's ungodly anger for his purposes as Psalm 76 verse 10 states, which it says, uh, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. This doesn't justify Samson's anger, but it shows the glory and power of God to use all things for to his purposes. So the wheat harvest was about the end of April or early May, the dry season, and it was a highly combustible state during this period, right? Easy to set fire. And although he had never consummated the marriage, Samson thought he was legally married to the woman of Timnah. And therefore, he took a gift and went to visit her in her father's house. And how shocked he was to learn that not only was he not married, but also the woman he loved was now married to his best man. And there are several surprised bridegrooms in the Bible. Adam went to, went to sleep a single man, and he woke up to learn happily that he was married. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. Jacob woke up and discovered that he was married to the wrong woman. In Genesis 29, verses 21 through 30. Boaz woke up to find his prospective wife lying at his feet on the threshing floor in Ruth chapter 3 verses 1 through 13. Samson had paid the legal bride price for his wife and now he had neither the money nor the wife. Samson was angry and even the offer of a younger and prettier bride did not appease him, right? It was also prohibited in Leviticus 18 verse 18. So if anybody should have been punished, it was his father-in-law, and he was the real culprit. After all, he took the money and gave the bride away to the wrong man. But Samson decided to take out his anger on the Philistines by burning up the grain in their fields. 
All right, this is uh, take verses 4 and 5. Samson strikes out against the Philistines by burning their crops. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches and turned the foxes tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go and the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. So... Samson seemed to act like a juvenile delinquent, yet God used it for all his purpose of fighting against the Philistines. Some object that Samson could not have captured 300 foxes, yet the word translated foxes actually or probably refers to a jackal and not a fox. And jackals are known to run in large packs, sometimes up to 200. Second, there is nothing that says Samson did all this by himself. And third, there is nothing that say that he did it all in one day, but he did it nonetheless. The word shual, translated foxes, right, also means jackals. And that's probably the animal that Samson used. Foxes are solitary creatures, but jackals prowl in large packs. Shalak really implies capture, right, snared into traps or pitfalls. Had he tried, uh, had he tied the firebrands to individual animals, they would have immediately run to their dens. But by putting two animals together and turning them loose, Samson could be fairly sure that their fear of the fire and their inability to maneuver easily would make them panic. Thus, they would run around frantically into the fields and ignite the grain. The fire then would spread into the vineyards and the olive groves. And it was the time of the wheat harvest, right? Verse 1, thus destroying the land's three main crops. And Deut- you'll see this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 13, and uh, Haggai chapter 1, verse 11. The Philistines, let's see, in verse 6 and 7, you're going to get the Philistines retaliate by killing Samson's wife and family. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. All right, so God used all this to uh, advance his plan for Israel. Israel and redemption, yet because of Samson's disobedience, it all happened at a great personal cost to Samson. It is fair to suppose that if Samson were obedient, God would have furthered his plan in the way that blessed Samson instead. So we have here the bitter story of retaliation, of trying to avenge the wrongs done to us. Retaliation is a never-ending story and one that never wins in the end. Those who trust in God must be able to say, retaliation belongs to God, I'll let him settle the score. Much of the war disaster, uh, deep-seated hatred, and pain in our world today comes from this instinct to retaliate. But Jesus told us to not retaliate an eye for an eye, but to take control of the situation by giving even more in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. When we do this, we act like God who did not retaliate against man for his sin and rebellion, but instead gave his only son to die for man. So since they couldn't hope to overcome Samson, they did the next best thing, and they vented their wrath on his wife and father-in-law. In In the long run, her betrayal of Samson didn't save her life at all, right? You'll note chapter 14, verse 5. John Corson will point out that her plan to protect her father by betraying her husband backfired completely, right? Had the exact opposite effect. And you'll note in verse 7, uh, as a cross-reference, Psalm 58, verses 10 and 11, and Psalm 76, verse 10. All right, verse 8, Samson and repays the Philistines for the murder of his wife. So he attacked them hip and thigh with great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. And this is an expression for a cruel, unsparing slaughter. Samson was a one-man army against the Philistines, and Samson had no more family and could trust virtually no one. He lived like a fugitive alone in a cave, right? So the idiom, leg on thigh, is a wrestling metaphor for a ferocious attack. And the, the Edom mentioned is not the... This isn't the Edom mentioned either in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 32, that's too far away, or 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 6, right? It hadn't been built yet. It was some elevated place in Judah near uh, Lehi, from which Samson could safely and conveniently watch the enemy. All right, verses 9 through 13, Judah surrenders Samson to the Philistines. Now the Philistines went up 
encamped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he had done to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. You can start to see a model starting to form here. The fact that the soldiers from the tribe of Judah gave up Samson to the Philistines shows just how much they were under the oppression of the Philistines. They would rather please their oppressors than support their deliverer. And this is a strangely common phenomenon. Often when someone stands up to evil, people are angrier at the one who stood up to the evil than they are at the evil itself. So, Samson didn't want to hear this or recognize it, right? Do you know that the Philistines rule over us? As far as he was concerned, the Philistines should not rule over the people of God. So they bound him with two new ropes, and uh, it seems that Samson submitted to this, assuming that this was true. It showed great faith on Samson's part. He was willing to put himself in a difficult position and to trust God to take care of him. So the invasion of Judah didn't help Samson's uh, popularity with his own people, who sadly were content to submit to their neighbors and make the best of a bad situation. Instead of seeing Samson as their deliverer, the men of Judah simply considered him a troublemaker. And it was Samson's own fa- own fault, right? He was a champion, but not a leader. He didn't challenge the people, organize them, and trust God to give them victory. So this was the only time during Samson's judgeship that the Jews mustered an army, and it was for the purpose of capturing one of their own men. A nation is in a sad state indeed when the citizens cooperate with the enemy and hand over their own God-appointed leader. And... Uh, We will see that they bound him with cords and brought him up. This is heroic, but they missed it. All right, take verses 14 through 17. Samson is going to use the jawbone of a donkey to kill a thousand Philistines. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and he killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey I have slain a thousand men. And so it was, when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. So Samson was unique among the judges because he was a one-man army against the Philistines. Other judges of Israel led armies against their enemies, but Samson fought alone. With this remarkable victory, we are conscious of what he might have done uh, had he been wholly yielded to the spirit of Jehovah, right, who came mightily upon him, instead of being so largely governed by the fires of his own passion. In Samson's bold declaration of victory was a poetic touch that is difficult to render in translation. One effort goes like this. With the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in mass, right? Ramath Lehi, this name initially means Jawbone Hill, and it was obviously an appropriate name for this place of Samson's great victory. One preacher came up with a five-point sermon on th- of the Jawbone of an Ass, likening it to the weapon of the gospel. It was a novel weapon. It was the most convenient weapon. It was a simple weapon. It was a ridiculous weapon, and it was a successful weapon, right? <clears throat> So in verse 14, we'll see loosed uh, translates melted. In verse 15, when he found a new jawbone of an ass, new in the Hebrew will translate into moist. An old one would have been too brittle, right? So do you see the irony here? The Philistines had the most advanced weapon technology of their day. They had iron, iron spears, iron chariots, and with it, they subjugated the Israelites. They had outlawed smiths and ironmongers in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19. And here, the Spirit of God had defeated 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a jackass. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Right? And you'll note Shamgar's ox goad in chapter 3, verse 31. One of David's mighty men would later slay 300 with a spear in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 11. So Samson had a way with words, and at his wedding feast, he devised a clever riddle, right? Chapter 14, verse 14. And after this great victory, he wrote a poem, and it's elegant, um, Paranomasia. 
based on the similarity between the sounds of Hebrew words kamor, donkey, and komer, heap, right? And James Moffat's rendering, rendering here would be, with the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in mass. With the jawbone of an ass, I have assailed assailants. So Ramoth Lehi means lifting of the jawbone or jawbone heights. All right, let's take verses 18 through 20. God provides for Samson miraculously. Then he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. Now, And now I shall die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank. And his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore he called its name in Hakor, which is in Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel twenty years in the days of the Philistines. So Samson needed to uh, needed this thirst to remind himself of his own weakness and need right after such a great victory. After a great victory, we need to remember our mortality. Right? It is very usual for God's people when they've had some great deliverance to have some little trouble that is too much for them. Samson slays a thousand Philistines and piles them up in heaps and then <laughs> he must needs die for want of a little water, right? Matthew Poole will comment on Samson's great thirst. It was partly sent by God that by the experience of his own imp- impotency that he might be forced to ascribe the victory to God only and not to himself. And of course, God uh, split the hollow place and water came out. And this is an example of the principle that uh, God's work done God's way will always be provided for by God. And here the Lord showed his faithfulness to Samson by supplying the needs of his servant. In his sermon, The Fainting Hero, Charles Spurgeon pointed out that the believer can look at heaps upon heaps of defeated enemies, heaps of your sins, heaps of your doubts and fears heaps of our temptations, heaps of uh, many of your sorrows, yet despite all these victories, fresh challenges will come, even as a deadly thirst and fatigue overcame Samson. And through this all, Samson could count on the fact that the past victory was a promise of future deliverance. And with that simple-minded faith, which was so characteristic of Samson, who is nothing but a big child, he turned his eye to his heavenly father and cried, O O Jehovah, Thou hast given me this great deliverance, and now I shall shall I die for thirst. After all that thou hast done for me, shall the uncircumcised rejoice over me, because I die for want of drink of water. Such confidence had he that God would interpose on his behalf. So be of good courage, fainting warrior. The God who made thee and has used thee knows thy frame, and what thou needest before thou askest. So, so often in scripture, testing will follow triumph, right? No sooner had the Israelites crossed the Red Sea that they became thirsty in Exodus 15 verses 22 through 27 and hungry in Exodus uh, chapter 16. Elijah's victory on Mount Carmel was followed by his humiliating flight to Mount Horeb in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. If triumphs aren't balanced with trials, there is a danger that we'll become proud and self-confident. Samson's prayer indicates that he considered himself God's servant and that he didn't want to end his life falling into the hands of the godless Philistines. Unfortunately, that's just what um, ultimately happened. So in Hakor will translate spring of the collar or the well of him who cried, right? The place where Samson slaughtered the Philistines received the name Jawbone Hill. Some translations will give the impression that the water came from the jawbone because the name of the place in Hebrew is Lehi, which means jawbone. In the New King James, Judges 15 verse 19 reads, So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi. In the NASB and NIV are sub substantially the same, right? <clears throat> then he judged the days of the Philistines uh, 20 years. And that ties up chapter 15. Next time, we will talk about Samson's disgrace and death in chapter 16. Thank you for joining me.